podcasting from the Star Group, home of the iconic Dressable Lions. This is Beyond the Known, the podcast that takes you a step beyond what you know about business. I'm your host, Paul M. Newberger, president of the Star Group. Today, we are joined by Sam Emery. He is the owner and partner of Merriman Social, Third Coast Provisions, and his newest venture, Flower Child. He is also responsible for the sales, marketing, PR, and front of house hospitality. Welcome, Sam. Thank you. I appreciate it, Paul. It's great to be here. So if you don't mind, Sam, I would love it if you could tell us the story of how working for a big company, in this case, one that truly cared more about money than people, affected your personal idea of managing a business. It's a pretty long story that, you know, and if you know me, a lot of people go for a bathroom break before story or let me get another beer before I start saying it. So I'll, I'll try to be concise. But, you know, I was working for this company. You know, it was one of the first things that I was ever successful in. You know, I had a tough time with school. It was really tough to, like, get the whole purpose behind things was a big thing for me. And it was like, okay, you make the dean's list in college. Then you kind of take a semester off. And it was like finally getting that job after college was like, oh, it's a big deal. And I always, people always said, you're going to be in sales. You're going to be in sales. You talk so much. You'd be good at sales. So I got into a sales role at this company. I won't say any names, but the first year was tough, big commission-based company. Second year was a little bit better. By the third year, I became the top rep in the company out of you know over 100 reps, and it was pretty overwhelming. You get the car, and you get, you're get you young, and you're, you're getting all this, this money coming in, and it just was, at one point, once you were kind of basking in this success, you'd look in the mirror, and you're like, what are you really doing here? You know, you're getting up, you're going out, you're, you're banging on doors, you're meeting with CFOs and CEOs and you're, you're playing with the big boys and it's, it feels good and it's great, but it's like, what am I, am I, I mean, I am helping their business a little bit. I am not even a little bit. We were helping, but it was just, it kind of felt pretty shallow when it came down to the leadership and what we're doing. It was, Where's the gross profit at? How much is this deal? Are you going to hit your quota? What does this look like? You're going to make the partner's dinner. You're going to make this. You're going to make this trip. We're going to give you this, this. And it, again, it's pretty intoxicating. Literally, <laughs> we, went, we went out a lot. And transitioning over, it's just I kind of was like, you know what? I'm going to go for this. I'm going to try to do right by my customer. And I'm going to try to still maintain this level of salesmanship and integrity but it was, I found myself having to be pretty devious and kind of become this different person when I was in front of the partners and the people that I reported to. So I decided I'm going to have a drop dead date and I'm going to leave and I'm going to do this restaurant thing full, you know, full time. So we had Merriment Social. Third Coast Provisions was just opening. You know, when you're opening a restaurant, it's like, you might want to keep your job for a little bit longer and make sure we're off the ground and doing okay. As soon as we were off the ground at Third Coast, it was like, I made top rep. There was all these accolades. There was all these trips. And I had to kind of keep composure until I left. And as soon as I left, they were not happy with me. They definitely thought I was a lifer at the company. And I just knew that if I told them respectfully and said, hey, I'm really not liking how things are going. I think that I can change. I just kind of knew that I needed to cut the cord at that point. And that brought me into the restaurant scene full time. So I've been doing it now for three and a half years, almost three and a half, four years. I, I couldn't help but picture as you're describing your previous organization, as you said, the, the sales culture, the ambition, the competition, there, there's certainly some virtues in that, but it sounds also like you're describing the importance of corporate culture. And, and based on what you've experienced, what would you say would be the one or two most important aspects of a healthy corporate culture? It's tough because they're kind of opposing ideas. Corporate culture, if you're talking about what's going to drive sales, that's a different thing versus, you know, the corporate culture of are you okay with who you are in this business? So I think the most important thing is having people feel comfortable in their own skin, what they're doing and proud to be what they're doing. If you can harbor a culture where people are, it sounds cliche, are excited to come to work because of the people they work with and what they're doing. You know, they are a part of this process of this world that is doing something good for other people, whether it's a service or a, a part of a part of a part that goes into making a, a bigger machine that helps with something. It's whatever that is, feeling comfortable with 
with what you're selling and what you're doing and just the corporate culture in general, feeling comfortable and excited with waking up with a sense of purpose. I think if you can harbor a, a culture where people wake up and they have a sense of purpose and they feel like they are contributing, that's a good thing. I mean, you strike me as a very hands-on guy. I mean, you're, you're involved professionally, you're involved personally. How does that personal involvement influence your environment, both personally and professionally? I'm sometimes too hands-on, people will say. If any of my employees listen to this, and you'll know who you are, they say that I'm passionate. That's a really nice way of, I can't, I'm not going to say any uh, swears on, the, on this podcast, but I have a lot of passion towards it because I was in this company that I didn't, I couldn't be myself. So I really like to, for others to feel comfortable and hiring people that, you know, you can joke around with, you know, even earlier in the podcast, setting up all these sound checks, you can tell that there's some personality with the star group. And I personally know that just knowing other people, but bringing my own personality into this and trying to have fun doing that. It influences things in, in a positive way. Sometimes it it's time to get back to work after joking around so much. But yeah, I mean, I have a lot invested in, in this company and we're having fun doing it. So it's kind of like a, a balance of, are you stressed? Are you happy? But when it comes into work and you're the one that people are looking to to, to harbor the, the company culture like you were talking to earlier is you have to have a positive personality. And the best way to do that is to do that honestly and try not to fake it. So you got to be okay with yourself before you, you kind of start telling other people what to do. Based on your experience, because what I hear you talking about is the importance of authenticity. But why is authenticity so important in the workplace? The truth will always come up. No matter how deeply you repress and fake out and try to be somebody you're not or be somebody you want to be, I think we all have had that experience of trying to be what you, you think you should be or people think you should be or your boss thinks who you should be and just trying to fit in in this culture of a ton of content. It's really tough to feel I can be authentic and I can be myself and I can be happy, but the truth will always come out. So, and it'll come out at the worst time ever if you're not careful and you're not comfortable with the person you're looking at in the mirror every morning. I'm curious, can you walk us through how you and your business partners met? They were my friends before they were my business partners, which there's a big difference. I mean, I'm sure that there's other people that have done it, vice versa. But yeah, I mean, walking you through the how we met again, get another coffee, go take a bathroom break. That's a long story. It's a good story because, you know, the way that we came together is an unconventional way. We have such differences in our personalities. The three-headed horseman that is is kind of heading the the two companies in this third restaurant on the way, Cameron White is one that actually is very familiar with the Star Group and works in banking. And our chef's name is Andrew Miller, who's our chef. He makes all the magic happen. So, you know, we build our restaurants around our chef, Andrew Miller. I met him in college. I was not in a good place. You know, I had just made the dean's list a couple times and kind of had that why am I doing this? Like I just learned what I learned and hit these numbers that you're supposed to hit. And then it's like, again, it's kind of a parallel to the job, you know, that kind of, I was unsatisfied. I didn't, I didn't care. So that led down a, a worse road than, you know, the restaurant did. I ended up meeting Andrew after he went to culinary school. So he went to culinary school at the Culinary Institute of America, which is dubbed the culinary Hogwarts. And it is a very in-depth, very regimented, tough school to get your master culinary degree in. Not only did Andrew graduate a year early from high school, but then he went to the Culinary Institute of America, you know, passed with flying colors, became an executive chef. He said, you know what, I'm going to get my business degree and I'm going to go to Northern Illinois University and I'm going to get my accounting degree so I can understand, you know, the business side of it, not only the culinary side. That's where I met him. And I had just kind of gotten out of this tough Pat's getting back into school and throughout my antics and this tough year that I had, I kind of built this house of Neanderthals of friends that I, I still have some of them. I, most of them I don't. And it was a horrible environment to go back to. So it was like, you know, I met Andrew and he's like, you know, he was pretty chunky. I was pretty chunky. I'm like, Hey, what have you been eating? What do you do? He's like, I'm a chef. I'm like, he became a friend right, right there just by default. 
I always loved to cook. I grew up with a mom who was always, always cooking. So, you know, we became good friends. He had this apartment that was way far away from this party house. So I started hanging out with him, cooking. We got a job at the country club. He lied on his, on his, his resume. So he just wanted to be a run of the mill line cook. He didn't want to be a chef anymore. He wanted to, he wanted to just be a college kid. You know, he didn't really have that experience in culinary school. So he hired me and, you know, we both were kind of just had a job through college. He ended up taking over the entire operation of the entire country club food and beverage program, turned it around, became one of the a really good restaurant in Sycamore, Illinois. So I kind of learned the restaurant industry through him and why you do things the way you do. I met Cameron along the way. They were business. They were best friends. So I naturally met Cameron. We all became good friends. Cameron was up here, got his first job out of college in Milwaukee. Didn't have a lot of friends. Was like, come visit Milwaukee. Come visit Milwaukee. Come move to Milwaukee is what he said first. And we're like, you know, we're all Bears fans. So it's like, why would we move to Cheese Town, man? We're not coming up there. We came up. We visited one time. It must have been just the perfect day. And, you know, Brady Street Festival, the sun was shining. It was, it was, it was a long night. And we had all of our friends up here. And it was just one of those nights that kind of, you know, ended at the casino with a pretty big win. It was just like, all right, well, we we will move to Milwaukee. We fell in love with Milwaukee. And it's kind of been the whole point of moving here was to start restaurants in kind of a different scene than downtown Chicago. But we've really fallen in love with the city and its outskirts more than we ever thought we had. Not its teams. Well, we'll certainly forgive you that one. It's really tough because there's a lot of things that I would redo. I've made a ton of mistakes. It's being cordial, being respectful, being professional in some situations, even though you want to fly off the handle or you think you're right or you think, I know more than you do. No matter how much intelligence or background you have, you know, there's been a couple situations where I've handled because I thought that I was, I knew more than the person sitting across from me and I was totally wrong. So just taking a step back, assessing the situation, even sleeping on it, hell, even a week, a week of thoughts behind an issue, take your time with your decisions because even the small ones become big ones and the big ones become small, but still just try to be respectful and understand who you're talking to and, and why you're making the decision. Yeah, it's certainly good advice. Why don't you tell us a story about one of the first times that you actually got involved to help the community? What was that like? It's tough to say the exact time where it, it kind of flipped and it kind of flipped at my last job a little bit where, you know, you're in control of the pricing and you're in control of kind of the story that you're bringing to your boss. So it's like, hey, you know, we're helping out this church or we're helping out this this nonprofit. And it's like they just the other the competitors were closer. So we had to be down there, which is a white lie. You could have just told him I wanted to help him out. But just that lick of doing the right thing, I think it makes everybody feel good and it's a win win for everybody. So you know, we've done some nonprofit events at Merriman Social. One of them was the Homeless Veterans Initiative. And it was like, you know, it was really when I was not involved in the in the business too much, but I was helping with this event. And it was almost every chef in Milwaukee participated in this. Not one person said no. It was chefs, the head chefs in Milwaukee, all in our place. We were brand new. And it just kind of was like, you know what? It's pretty easy, you know, to rally the troops and People are cool with being on board and helping. You know, if you give them an opportunity to do something good, most people will rise to the occasion. So I think that was one of the first times I was like, man, this is a big event. And all people had to do is just work hard and call everybody and have a plan. And it worked. We raised a ton of money and it was like, we should do this more often. And I know you give back because you have the ability to help, as I mentioned earlier. But on a larger scale, Sam, where does your passion for community service come from? Probably my parents. They were both very compassionate, and the, the lessons were always treat people with respect, and, and if you can help, you can help. You know, we went to San Francisco as a kid. I think I was maybe 9 or 10, and, like, my parents always tell the story. They just told the story last weekend that I was just giving all of the homeless people money and food, and the whole time they were, like, you know, it's in some cases – you know, surrounded by homeless people. And then they were almost to the point where it was like, we need to get him out of there. Um, <laughs> like you shouldn't be, you know, they're touching me, rubbing me on the head. And it was kind of like, you know, 
that, but I just, I don't know. I always kind of saw people and if they weren't happy, it doesn't make you feel good. So I was always, always been pretty empathetic, sometimes too empathetic in some situations where it's like a, somebody who's not doing their job at all, but they're a really good guy. And it's like, oh, he's, he's a great guy though. Like, you know, we got to help him, you know, but I think it comes from my parents again, as cliche as that sounds. How would you talk to somebody that, that says this? I want to get involved, but I'm just one person. I'm one person in a sea of billions and billions of people. I'd say you're not one person because you're the same person who's thinking just like those other billions of people. I, if, I, if I do this, what's going to happen? And if you all just chose to say yes and let's do this, then you're, you're a billion dollars. You're not a, a $1 that you're, you're taking care of. It's the same concept with voting and Again, I think more than ever, people are really inside their own lives and don't really realize what's happening outside their own little microchasm of a, of a, a life. You wake up, you do this, you're regimented, that's great and everything, but it's really it's easy to not see the bigger picture. But if everybody's working together, if everybody's helping your neighbor and you're, everyone's just kind of getting along, it's like it's extremely powerful. So if everybody thought, ah, I'm just one person, I can't do this, I mean, there would be chaos everywhere, so... That's what I'd say, to say the least. Also joining us in the studio today is Nick Starr. Nick is the director of agency advancement here at the Star Group, as well as one of our commercial insurance architects. Nick, thanks for being here today. Absolutely. Sam Emery, what's going on, man? What's up, bro? Happy to have you here. It's amazing to hear you speak about how you guys got started and who you are, because Living downtown Milwaukee, you really see the organizations that have a, a true definition of what hospitality is and means. So shifting over to you, I'd love to hear your definition or, or to you, what is the meaning of hospitality? It's a good question. I think that anybody who's in the restaurant industry will agree. For some reason, restaurant tours or, or being in the restaurant is like kind of like a be like, oh, wow, you know, you have a restaurant like anybody who owns a restaurant will know like, yes, it's a good business, but like, it is not a business. that's like, we're going to go in and we're going to, we're going to make so much money. <laughs> if that's your drive, like those are the ones that go out of business. As far as hospitality, I've read a bunch of books. I've tried to learn, you know, the way that anyone learns anything of hospitality. But again, I keep bringing this back. I don't really mention my parents as much as this, but my mom gave me the best advice. And it's like, your restaurant is like your home. How did you grow up? You know, you can either invite people in and say, what would you like to drink? What do you want to do this? Or you can scream at them and tell them to take their shoes off at the door. You know, it's your restaurants are a place for people to come gather, feel welcome, feel comfortable. You know, again, in my last career, we were, you're selling other things. Here, it's like you're trying to escape whatever life you're There's drinks flowing. There's, there's, there's good food. It's, it's a good time. So a lot of times for people to have a good time, they have to feel comfortable and welcome. And sometimes there's over assertive hospitality. It's like, hi, how are you? You know, you're filling your water glass every two seconds. You're interrupting every two seconds in the easiest form possible. Hospitality is making people feel comfortable like they are at their own home and they, they can be themselves as soon as they walk into that door, especially for the first time. Which is great. And I can personally attest to that. And it's really admirable. I should say what you guys have done with a lot of the nonprofits and, and startups in the Milwaukee area, I've never felt so comfortable referring these groups of people to an organization. And uh, it's basically because of who you are and who you guys are that makes it happen. You know, there's so many venues that are strict in terms of, yeah, it's $5,000 to rent it, either take it or leave it. And what's been amazing about you guys is you've welcomed a lot of these smaller starting nonprofits into your home and said, tell us what you can do and we're going to work with you on it. You know, obviously it, me it needs to make sense for both parties, but you're not someone that draws that line in the sand or, or your organization's not someone that draws that line in the sand and says, either you have the money or you don't. And there's a number of organizations that we've, you know, sent your way where you've taken such good care of them, where they just have the, the highest of accolades to, to say about, you and the organization. So well done and, and thank you uh, on that front. But I also wanted to switch gears and, and give you an opportunity to tell 
any of our viewers who are not familiar with your restaurants a little bit about them. They all have such unique personalities. And obviously with the third one on the way, I think people are excited and curious to know more about that. So yeah, if you could talk a little bit about each restaurant. Sure. And thank you for mentioning how you feel about the nonprofit help. And I appreciate you sending people our way. I mean, a lot of people don't think it's not like I'm giving them thousands of dollars and like I have to do it as a, but to them, there's so many organizations that aren't willing to even, you know, I, I, we get so many emails. Can you donate? Can you donate? Can you donate? But when you hear a live voice that says, Hey Sam, can we jump on the phone and talk through this? It's not just a letter asking for a donation. And it's mostly, they just need our space. If they're flexible, we can be flexible, but I really, truly appreciate all of the, the people that you've sent our way because it does harbor relationships. And this is a small town. So like the more people that know about your place, we're restaurant. So more people that have been there for any other reason besides to eat, like, and then they're like, oh, this, this food's actually pretty good. Like you should be open as a restaurant every day. And I'm like, we are open every day actually. But thank you so much for saying that. As far as our restaurants, Merriman Social is our firstborn baby. We had no idea what we were doing. Um, well, somewhat of an idea. We had barely any money, big warehouse. I would call it Americana. It's kind of like the fluidity of the menu has no fluidity. There's like dim sum, Asian style cuisine, Asian style wings. There's, you know, we have a primarily Hispanic and Boricua, you know, staff. So we have a lot of Hispanic influence. Some of the best Mexican food I've ever had in my life is when they're cooking like a side pot of something while they're prepping on a Wednesday. We have amazing burgers. Our fried chicken's amazing. I love fried chicken. I eat it too often. I even like take home. I'm like, can you guys just make me chicken fingers and I'll take those home? But it's it's kind of a fun, large, very welcoming space. It's not too serious. It's not too swanky, but it's really good for private events of all sizes, buyouts. We've do, we do some weddings there. We do some rehearsal dinners. And like we were talking about earlier, congratulations on your engagement. If you are going to be going to for a destination wedding, you're going to stay in town. You let me know if you need anything. Um, at either of the spots. That's Merriment Social in a nutshell. It's at 240 East Pittsburgh Avenue. Again, it's Merriment Social. The noun for Mary, like there was Merriment in Nick's eyes when he proposed. The next restaurant we opened was Third Coast Provisions, just over three years old. East Coast, West Coast, they call the Great Lakes the Flyover Coast or the Third Coast. I still get in arguments with my business partners that we branded it as a seafood restaurant because it's like we could do the surf and the turf, but we have really become Milwaukee's premier seafood restaurant and elevating, you know, some of the standards around seafood, utilizing Lake Superior and the Great Lakes fish and doing them in more unique ways. It is a very pretty restaurant, almost uncomfortably pretty. Sometimes when people want to come in and have just a drink, which is why we have the lower level, which is a little bit more casual. It's great for events. It's great for just grabbing a beer. Uh, but that space is is great, and the food there is is allowed Andrew to really get into the granular, funky, fermented, just the specific ingredients that most people haven't heard of. So that gives us an an opportunity to talk to our guests about this is what this is. You may not have heard of this. You can imagine in Milwaukee, meat and potatoes and like and beer and cheese. You know, some people don't know what what this is or why this is more expensive because this is where it comes from. It's the only place where it comes from. So our third restaurant, Flower Child, I can't talk a ton about it just because we have a lot that we're still figuring out from a branding perspective. But the biggest thing to be surprised about it, it's Flower Child, F-L-O-U-R-C-H-I-L-D, which plays into kind of getting really good flour for what we hope and what I wish I don't have to hype it up, but it's really, really good pizza. And so that'll kind of be at the forefront of really good accessible pizza. That's like, oh, you're from Chicago. It's like not all pizza from Chicago is deep dish pizza. It's kind of a conglomerate of, of thin crusts, hand tossed. We've kind of settled on what Andrew Cam and I like in the pizza, which when you become friends for this long, you end up kind of liking the same things. Crispy, not too doughy, really crushable pizza. Like you eat a lot of pieces of this pizza. A lot of people mention go into Italy and it's like, oh, I have a gluten indeficient or a deficiency and I, I can't eat gluten. They go to Italy and it's like, oh, I was eating pasta the whole time. And it's like, and I'm fine. That's because the flour is not baked with bleach. It doesn't have a bunch of preservatives in it. So we will be bringing cracked milled flour from Wisconsin. Everyone says farm to table, but outside of, of the pizza, we're going to be making our own breads for sandwiches. 
we loved doing sandwiches. Again, we're all pretty husky boys. We like to eat sandwiches. Who doesn't? Um, so uh, there's the sandwich aspect to it. There's that. So if you want to like get some appetizers and get pizza and really go to town, you can. We'll have beer on tap. But like on the other side of it is what I'm most excited about is bringing kind of a vegetarian and lunch scene to the middle of Milwaukee where anybody who lives downtown, will. there's not a ton of places to eat a good lunch. That's not super expensive. That's grab and go. You know, the other side of it is very fresh product, very fresh produce. And our menu is going to kind of be flipped from the standard restaurant where it'll be 70, 80 percent vegetarian. And, you know, the other side will be kind of meat more. We'll have different proteins on the menu and stuff. But this kind of concept of flower child is a little bit of everything. There's kind of a gap in the market for people who want to indulge without feeling like they overindulged, you know, you can come, you can get a, a small pizza, you can get a an avocado bowl or some sort of really tasty salad that's not just saturated with like a such a heavy dressing on it that you can get in and out and have a couple glasses of wine, a fresh dinner, and yeah, you can have a piece of pizza or two and not leave feeling like, oh, let's get out of here. Let's, I can't wake up in the morning and work out. So there's going to be kind of this fresh, concept that's going to be brought for lunch and dinner where you can come in and grab a glass of wine, you can come in and grab a beer, you can get a pizza, but it's kind of all over the place. Like I said, we're now I'm starting to talk and kind of spitball in my own head. So I'll regress. <laughs> no, that digress. Sounds, yeah, no, that sounds incredible. We're all really excited to try it. Do you have an estimated rough date of when you guys think you might be? We're shooting for April, May, most likely May um, as these things continue. Excellent. It's great. Every single day is a, a new adventure. <laughs> but so what are you, how are you feeling about all the, the hype and excitement? I and mean, we've got the DNC coming up. We've got all these new pockets popping up. I mean, kind of explain from your guys' perspective how, how you feel. We, I think we feel pretty good about our decision staying up here. I mean, uh, we're thankful that you know, the boroughs are growing the way that they are. Even Milwaukee Street kind of have, has had its renaissance and it's coming back and Walker's Point and, and kind of that, you know, warehouse district is coming back and, you know, with the Deer District and, and just, I think the whole city is just kind of going through this culinary renaissance right now where people are coming in and from different states and, and want to be here. Yeah, DNC, you know, Ryder Cup, we don't know what to expect on it. I'm getting quite a bit of fun calls. Some where people want to like sleep over and like bring cots in. And at Merriman Social, we said no to that one. But uh, it's exciting because, you know, we always said high tide rise all boats. So other restaurants, you know, in Chicago and other spots, like it's, it really is competitive. So it's really hard to be like, oh, Nick, you're opening up a restaurant. Like it's pretty easy to be like, I do you hope that Nick does a good job? In Milwaukee, it's a lot different. It's it, the more places people can go, the more this is a destination, the more the city will populate. And yeah, I mean, I think this was the plan. So everything's growing and it's only good for us if the city grows and everyone does well. So we're pretty excited about what 2020 is going to bring. Awesome, man. One last question for me, but for any of the restaurant individuals that are listening or anyone that's considered getting into the hospitality arena, what advice do you have from an experienced restaurateur what advice do you have for these individuals? Be patient and work very hard. You have to work super, super hard. And if you don't have that kind of itch that some people have to just always be doing something, you got to have a lot of energy. I mean, just do it. I mean, if you're looking to do something on your own, if you're working at a company and you're like, I don't like this, I don't know if I can do this on your own, like you can, like you, you really can. There's no reason to not kind of take that leap or take that jump. Like the worst that that happens is it doesn't work and you're probably going to go back to either that same job or something similar. So take risks. Like this is a life that we were kind of gifted with. So it's like try to take advantage of it and enjoy the ride. But yeah, it has its moments. I've talked very positively about everything this whole time <laughs> and it's not the case. You know, there's dark days, there's tough days, whether it be money or payroll or what you can do, but these restaurants are real businesses that need to be run like a real business. So as much as you need you know how to make a pie, you still need to know how to sell that pie, price that pie, and do it the right way. So luckily, I have kind of like a, 
accounting guru and a chef. And then Cameron's a commercial banker. So like, I don't really have to do that much thinking. I just get to talk to you. Awesome. Well, thanks so much. Well, I got to tell you, this has been an educational conversation, a fun conversation. And Sam Emery, I know you're one of the busiest human beings on the planet. So the fact that you would come by our studios here at the Star Group really means a lot. Had a lot of fun. Appreciate it, Sam Emery. Nick Starr, thanks to you as well. And uh, I appreciate the conversation today, guys. Thank you. Yeah, Sam, again, really, really appreciate you taking the time to join us today. It means a lot. Anytime. We'll do it off the record next time. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Beyond the Known with Paul M. Newberger. If you like our show and want to know more, check us out at stargroup.com. That's S-T-A-R-R group.com slash podcast. We're also available on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts.